All right, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you for all those who helped. And I know some of them aren't here, so I apologize I didn't get a chance to thank them, but what a great team we had getting all the stuff ready, especially since I know a lot of times we do fellowship luncheons with uh, haystacks, people bring their lettuce already chopped or the tomatoes already chopped. We had none of that, because I went and got it at Costco and Cash and Carry, so we had to do it all today. What a great team. I'm hiring you guys. I'm hiring you guys. So, and because, as people know, men aren't really the best judge of how much food to get, because, you know, you don't even you make sure you have enough. So we had like twice as much, so guess what? We're doing haystacks again next Sabbath. <laughs> so I'll be checking with people for beans and rice again. But we got all the other stuff available. All the other stuff available. So I'm just going to be asking for beans and rice again. Because everything else we got plenty of. So anyway, okay. So thank you for being here. Thank you for those that are viewing via uh, uh, live stream. And so I just want to uh, turn this time over to Herb. Let's have a quick prayer before we begin. Father in heaven, thank you again for your Sabbath, for your, for your goodness, for your love for us. Thank you for the cross and uh, just a message we heard this morning about what you, were able, what you were willing to endure, Lord, what you did endure, what you sacrificed in our behalf, Lord. It just uh, it, it, We can maybe crap, cr grasp the tip of the iceberg of what all that Herb shared, Lord. I'm sure that it goes much deeper than that, and we know we'll be learning for eternity. But thank you for helping us to see you in your love and your mercy and your graciousness unto us in a little deeper way that draws us even that much closer to you. And now as we take this time for these next two meetings, we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide and direct Herb's lips. Give him just the words you'd have to share and give us ears to hear. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, Chuck was just saying we didn't rebuke Satan right there, so we'll do that again quick. <laughs> Am I on here? <clears throat> yeah, I know like, like uh, Chuck said, you know, like I get involved a lot of times with demonic issue stuff. And so, so understanding what I understand by involved in that kind of stuff, that I, I figure why should we have the demons around us, you know, because I mean... They're going to want to be here to try to distract our minds, to do all sorts of stuff. So, so some people say, well, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be talking to the devil that way. You shouldn't be. I had one place I went to a university, one of our Adventist universities, and they said, um, they wrote an article afterwards and said, I pray to the devil. I said, well, if you call Get Lost in the Name of Jesus praying, well, I guess I do. Anyways, we'll just pray one more time. Father God, we just invite you here today. We don't even have to invite you here. We, all we have to do is declare before the universe that we are gathered in your name because you said if we're gathered in your name, you'll be here. So thank you for being here, Father God. Jesus, we, we want your blood anointed on the doorposts of this church, on the doorposts of our heart as a deterrent against the destroyer. And Satan, in the name of Jesus, you and your evil forces get lost. Again, this is closed between ourselves and our Father God. Holy Spirit, the time is yours. In the name of Jesus, amen. So, okay, so I thought this afternoon I'll go to an, another one. You, by now, you're probably finding out that there's lots of texts in the Bible that sometimes bend me a little wrong. Like I said, it's not that I don't, uh, it's not that I don't believe what I'm reading. It's not that I think that it was written wrong. It's just that when they get me, like, like I don't like what I read, sort of, it's usually tells me, if I don't get it, there's probably a nugget hidden under here. And I dig in those places. I dig in places that seem the, that seem the least likely produce something. And, and here's a text, like I'm going to Book of John. Now, I've said that lots of times. In the New Testament, the Book of John, without a doubt, is my favorite book. Bar none. I've started it, can't tell you how many times. I don't know about hundreds, but like piles and piles of times. And I rarely get done with it because what happens, and here's what's interesting. In engineering, I've got tons of engineering manuals. You can ask my wife about this if you ever get a chance to. She said I'm the weirdest guy she's ever met because I'll lay in bed at night sometimes reading 
the latest math or whatever on some thing I'm trying to figure out with, en with engineering. So I got these big fat textbooks with nothing but numbers. And she says, that is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. I, I didn't marry that. <laughs> of course, she's joking, but whatever. But you know what? I can read pretty technical stuff. And I wouldn't say master it, but I can grasp it enough where I get it. Maybe not the first reading, but second reading, third reading. I can land it. But you know what's amazing about the Bible? In my Bible, the book of John is 34 pages. 34 pages is nothing in terms of something that you could read and get. And yet, for some reason, I can never get to the bottom of it. And here's what John wrote, wrote in the very end of his gospel. And, yeah, it's not much of a book when you think about volume or size. But um, this is a disclaimer he writes at the very end of his book. Sort of a disclaimer, sort of a, I got to clarify this here. Here's what he says. Very last verse in the book of John. So that's uh, 21, last verse. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. So what is he telling us here? I lived, I walked, I spent time with Jesus, and my minuscule little book here is nothing. I'm embarrassed to even, you know, this is behind the scenes, right? I am embarrassed to even issue this little, in my Bible, 34-page book because it's so inadequate at covering everything I discovered walking with Jesus. So, what does that tell me? Because I got that kind of a mind. That tells me that whatever John writes has to be what he considers the cream. See, if you want to, if you want to know facts about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, uh, and, uh, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, will do an adequate job, synoptics. They will do a pretty good job at giving you all the details you want to know. But if you want to feel Jesus, you want to sense him, you want to get in his head space, you want him to get in your head space, you read the book of John. Because he has a way of giving you the warm and fuzzies of Jesus. But, his disclaimer at the end of the book is telling me that what he wrote is what he thinks we need to know. So if somebody's going to summarize something, they're not going to waste words. You know what I'm saying? They're not going to put something in there that's just filler. So that's why everything John writes, if I don't get it, to me it's like a, hmm, what's going on here? You know, if it's not real obvious, to me it's a place to dig. So one day... You know, which, I've, like I said, I've started the book of John, and I don't want to say hundreds, but dozens, whatever, times, and, and rarely get through it, because what happens is I, as I read, I come to something, and it's like, hmm, never thought about that before, never saw that. It's a 34-page book, you know? I told you, I can, with my inadequate brain, which is very inadequate, I mean, my GPA, and like I said in school, will tell you that intellectualism is not my thing, but... I'm reading along and all of a sudden something hits me and it's like, ah, oh, yeah, I can't carry on anymore. I'm not going to finish the book this time. And I get off on this new rabbit trace. So one time I thought, well, okay, this happens to me all the time. So the first two, three chapters, certainly the first chapter of John has become a vain repetition to me. What do I mean by that? Because I've started it so many times. In the beginning was the Word and the Word, and I can't memorize things, but the Word is with God and the Word God. I know all this stuff because I've read it so many times. So I just blow by it. When I read, it's just like, let's get to page chapter three or four where, where maybe I haven't read it as many times. So, but this one day I thought, okay, I see what's going on with myself. I'm just blowing through this stuff. Maybe there's something there that I've just missed before. So I slowed right down. Just analyzed. Just dug, 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 dug. Praying down the Holy Spirit. I use that term a lot. What do I mean by that? It's... When I say praying down the Holy Spirit, before I study, I say, look, Jesus, you promised me that you will give me the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will teach me a few things. Ooh, ooh, sorry, did I misquote that? All things. So if he's going to teach me all things, why do I have to go to Tony Campolo or anybody else and read to try to get it? This, I made this decision years ago. 
I don't need it. I used to read the stuff, not that I'm averse. Lots of people like Ty Gibson's a friend of mine. He'll hand me one of his new books once in a while or whatever and say, have a read. I'll do that. But, you know, and, and I only read books. If somebody highly recommends them and I really trust their judgment, I only read them at night anyways. And I don't read a lot at night. You know, I got them beside my bed. And so I'll read maybe 10, 15 minutes. Lots of books. I don't get it. Gone. Somebody else gives you another one. Don't get it. Gone. Once in a while, you know, my imagination gets involved enough where I'll stick with it. And it is a good book. And a lot of times what I do, if I, this is what I do a lot too. If somebody gives me a book or, or, or whatever, because I don't buy them, but if somebody gives me a book, which I get hundreds, my dad is my guinea pig. He likes to read. So I get all these books given me, a lot of times by the author themselves. And so I say, here, Dad, read it. If it's good, let me know. So he, <laughs> oh, yeah, that was a good book. Trouble is, is so many of them are good, I can't trust his judgment anymore. So, but anyway, so I use him as a guinea pig, and he knows that. So he reads them ahead of time, and if it's really, really, really good, well, then I might have a look at it. But, so the, the point is this, because what I used to assume when I read a book is... If they've written a book, they've got to be an authority on it. And especially if they've got letters behind their name, like MA or PhD or something. Then my, my subconscious is, I've got to listen because they're smart about this. No, right. I learned that doesn't work. And then I, get, then I come along and I, and, I get, uh, and I get my wife who says, you write books, isn't that a bit hypocritical? You're expecting other people, this is my wife, you know, my wife's a real, she's a party animal in a good way, you know, like she doesn't drink party, but she's a party animal. And, and lots of people, this is what everybody says about my wife, wherever Tammy, my wife's name is Tammy, wherever she lands, the party breaks out. Because it's true. She wants fun all the time. But she's also, you know, a critic too. So, so stuff like that, you say, you know, you're spending months on this book you're writing. Uh, why are you writing that? Isn't that hypocritical? You don't read other people's books and you don't think people should read books, so why are you writing one? <laughs> That's a very good point. I don't know, but whatever. So I can't get around that one. And hopefully she's not watching online, which I don't think she would. But <clears throat> anyhow, probably doesn't even know. I didn't even tell her it is online. I didn't find that out anyways until recently. But so the point is, is when I get to this book here, one day I decided to slow down. That was just a rabbit chase. I don't know why. She says I'm ADHD, but I'm not sure if she's right. But 1 John, let's go to verse 6. So I started reading here one day. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Is he writing about himself? No, he's writing about John the Baptist, right? This is what he's talking about. John's writing about John the Baptist. So he's leading into this. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Okay, Obviously, John, like the other disciples, think John the Baptist is a pretty big deal. I mean, after all, he was Elijah returned. So they all bring up John the Baptist. Matthew in Matthew 11:11 11, 11 says, John the Baptist is the greatest who was ever born of a woman. Well, how many does that include? Everybody but Adam and Eve. Because they weren't really born of a woman. They were just sort of made, right? It's created. So the point is, is, so here we have, uh, that's how important John the Baptist is. So I decide, well, Paul, or, or sorry, John is writing about this, so John must think this is pretty important that uh, we read about this. So I read those two verses, then I get to the eight, verse 8. And this is what, like, I thought, why? He was not the light. Now, that doesn't probably bother you, but someone like me, that really bothers me. Why would you waste the air on that one? Why would you, write, why would you wait, waste some ink on that one? Because it's like this. If I told you, do you guys realize, all you here, do you realize that this isn't a bar that we're in here tonight? Am I right? Of course I'm right. But what is, what is the assumption, what do I think of you to have to tell you that? You know what kids do? I've, I've been through the kid thing, you know what they do? Duh. The more they swing their head, the sassier it gets. My kids didn't do that, honestly, they did. But whatever. 
That's okay. Duh. So this is a, a duh moment by John. Why would you say that John was not the light? So I read that and I thought, weird. Why would you waste your energy telling me something I already know? Like, why do I know that? Because let's go right to John 8. Now this is going to be a chronology quick. Because what I did when I saw that, I thought that's ridiculous to say that. Of course I know that's true, but you don't have to tell me that. And, and, and so the point is, is but... Because that bugged me, I thought, hmm, what else, what else does John say about the light? That was an easy one. Go to Esword, boom, boom, type in light. Boom, there's all the references like that from the book of John. So the first one I come to that's important is, is John 8, verse 12. Jesus speaking here, important to get. Then Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. Okay, if Jesus says I'm in the light of the world, we're gonna, I'm going to believe it. So why, John, would you tell me that John the Baptist isn't the light of the world? It's a duh moment. So I kept looking at some more. I get to verse 9, and then it got more interesting. Or not more verse 9, I'm sorry. Chapter 9, verse 5. And here's what it is. Jesus speaking is again. So Jesus is doing all the speaking here. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, do you see any difference between this thing that Jesus says and the one we just read in chapter 8? Big difference. There he categorically says, I am the light of the world. This one, he, said, he, puts, a, he puts a condition on it. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So if he says that, he puts a condition on it. The assumption is, if I'm not here, I am not... There's no light. I'm not the light of the world, right? As long as I'm here, I'm the light of the world. But if I'm not here, then I'm not the light of the world. Whoa, this gets scary. Getting scary. We're going to lose the light if we don't look out. So let's go to chapter 12, moving along here. John's writing this stuff. Whether John thought about this or whether it was providentially get him, whatever, cool stuff. And I won't get into everything, but we'll, we'll get enough where we get the point here. So, going to John 12, down to verse 35. Then Jesus said unto them, who's speaking here again? Jesus. Yet a little while is the light with you. Well, what does that say? The light is with you a little while, but the light is going to be going away. Hmm. Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light. Okay, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he go. While you have light, believe in the light that you may be the children of light. Okay, so we get clearly here that Jesus is trying to break the news to us gently. I'm the light of the world, as long as I'm here, the light of the world. And yet a little while you have the light. But remember, you're the children of light. I don't know what that means quite yet, but we're going to get there. So then, skipping a bunch of other ones here, but let's because there's lots of cool text on it. But let's go to... Uh, John 16, moving further ahead, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, what is Jesus saying here? It's expedient for you, in other words, to your benefit that I split the scene. No, Jesus, if you're the light of the world and when you're gone there's no light, why would you leave? Why do you say it's our benefit, it's expedient, it's to your benefit if I leave soon? Why? Well, he gives us the reason why, but we don't understand it quite yet. He says, because if I don't go, I can't give you the comforter. Who's the comforter? John 14 tells us the comforter is the Holy Spirit. So, if I don't go, I can't give you the Holy Spirit. But we have to realize if he goes, we've lost the light of the world. So, what does this mean? We get the Holy Spirit. What, what happens here? Let me ask you a question. When did Jesus' ministry officially start? Yeah. Baptism. At his baptism. When he came up out of the water, what happened? A dove, the Holy Spirit, descended upon him, and he became the light of the world. That was when his ministry started. He became the light of the world when the Holy Spirit endowed him. Now he's telling us, for your benefit that I get out of here quickly so that I can endow you with the Holy Spirit. 
Now, if when Jesus became the Holy Spirit, he became the light of the world, what's going to happen to us if we're endowed with the Holy Spirit? We'll be baby lights growing up into becoming the light, but it all can't be. Like, who am I? I can't be the light of the world. Let's go to Matthew 5. There's a lot of other verses in John here that play with this, but let's just go to Matthew 5. And, um, and we'll look at Matthew 5. Matthew, he doesn't get into all this nice little subtlety that gets us thinking and leads us to a conclusion. Matthew just cuts right to the chase. He sort of spills the beans. It's like telling the, you know, the punchline of the joke before you've told the joke. You know? So here's what, Paul, here's what Matthew says in 5 verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost the savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of the men. Now here's what he says. John in 5.14, or sorry, Matthew in 5.14, you are the light of the world. What does that do for you? We're all, we're all going through life searching for relevance. We're all going through life searching for, for something that tells us we're good for something. And here John breaks this slowly. Jesus is going. Oh, he's, and it's going to be soon. Jesus is telling us through John. It's, I have to go quickly so that I can make you the light of the world. I mean, can, j, j, we have to, sometimes I, I can just say it, but what you have to do is just sit down for half an hour and imagine that. I'm the light of the world. And here's what's amazing. John the Baptist, the greatest who ever lived, was not the light of the world. Meaning, us on this side of the cross have been given something that John the Baptist wasn't even given. That is our value to God. I mean, I'm not sure I would do this, but if President Biden came along and said, Herb, I want you to give Dixie cups of water out to people on the side of the street. Doesn't give me a reason why or whatever. That's probably a bad analogy. Let me think of another one. If Bill Gates says, Herb, I would like you. <laughs> I poly I'm, I'm, I'm not getting into politics here, but let's just say, let's just say I can relate to a little easier. Okay, so Bill Gates, owner of Microsoft, or one of the major shareholders, he says, Herb, I'd like you to give Dix Dixie cups of water out to the, the people as they walk by in front of Microsoft building. You know what? I'd probably do it, not even knowing why I'm doing it. Because it's an important commission by an important person. Thinking that, well, there might be something to this. What happens if Jesus, part of the King of Kings, Lord, Lord's creator of the universe, if Jesus says, I am making you the light of the world? Now get this text. Let's go to Acts 13, 47. Yeah, first 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, okay, this is, what the, this is what Jesus has commanded us, saying, I have set you to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the earth. Grasp that. He says, I make you the light of the world so that you can be salvation unto the end of the world. Not, not that what we do, but we have been commissioned as the hands, the feet, and heart of Jesus to be salvation unto the world. Jesus is dependent on us. We have this huge honor that John the Baptist or pre-cross didn't have. We have it. We are the light of the world because it's paid for at the cross. Satan was defeated. We're given a commission that means something. What are we going to do with it? Like I said, if Bill Gates had me passing out Dixie cups, I think that'd be pretty cool. What if Bill Gates says, you're going to be out recruiting all our newest and latest uh, people. You know, like for, you're going to be our HR or whatever, recruiting people. Well, that'd be pretty important. Jesus is saying you're the light of the world. What are we to do with that? That's the cool thing. And that's the part. This is where the Christian life really happens. This is where the fun in life happens. See, Everybody has a little different view of planning ahead. I'm a procrastinator, I admit it. But I work great under pressure. So it works for me. 
My wife, on the other hand, is a completely the opposite. If we plan a trip somewhere, you know, go to the cabin, whatever it is, uh, she will have the entire menu for the five days or whatever we're there written out for every day. Everything's purchased. Everything's just tickety boo t- To me, that is boring. We travel somewhere. I like to pay for the first night and then just wing it after that. <laughs> and yes, if my wife were here, she'd be standing up and probably declaring this. We spent the night in the car a few times in the past because there were no motels available because there's something going on in the city where we're at or whatever. But still, the spontaneity of all that and the stuff that comes along with it, to me, I like. I like that kind of stuff. She's the other way around. You know, my kids, they travel every summer. They, two months every summer, they go off. Asia, Africa, whatever. They buy two nights. My kids, my two sons, they took after me for sure. They buy two nights when they get there and after that, they wing it. It's... Airbnbs that sleep on people's beds, whatever that program's called, or couches, whatever it's called. They do that. It's worked for them for a number of years now, traveling heavily all over the world in the summertime. I like that because I like adventure. I like spontaneity. I like stuff coming at me that I haven't planned to have to make corrections over the whole thing. That's the way I am. That's why Christian living fits right into me. Because when you give yourself over to Jesus, you recognize you're the light of the world. And then you go launch out from there. It's exciting. I get lots of people come up to me and say, oh, I want to get into business. So I ask them, why? Well, then I can make lots of money, then I can go help people. And I said, well, it doesn't work that way. What do you mean it doesn't work that way? I said, if you aren't doing anything now, you're not going to be honored with the the greater. God works this way. You're faithful over little things. I'll make you ruler over bigger things. I one time was flying to Texas and there was a tennis player. Um, he's ranked 15th in the world or 17th, one of those, and, and, the, and the amateurs. And he's already played in the Davis Cup tennis. And he's on his way and he's sitting next to me. We're on our way to Texas. And uh, we get talking. Make a long story short, I start talking about this. I find out he's a United Church, quotes Christian. And I know a lot about the United Church. There's, unfortunately, there's not a lot there anymore. And it's more of a Canadian thing. It's an amalgamation of a bunch of different denominations trying to create enough people to at least keep the churches going. And so anyways, so I'm talking to him all the way down and I'm saying so, and I find out he, his folks go to United Church and he grew up going to the United Church in North Vancouver from where I'm from. I said, where are you going? He's got full ride scholarships. I think it was five universities. I'd have to go back to my notes and figure out, but whatever. Five universities and he's going, they all want this kid desperately. Hey, if you're 15th in the world, you already played in the Davis Cup. You're a catch. He's like 19 years old, and they all want to give him a full-ride scholarship to tennis. So I'm pretty excited. And this kid is good-looking. He's Sri Lankan background. He's built. He's got a great, not built, but I mean, he looks good. Personality. He's got conversation skills. And so I thought, how am I going to breach a spiritual subject? So I just turned to him and I said, man, you are so well put together. Everything. You got it all. Talented. I said, you must be a Christian. That's how it started, you know. Set him up a little bit. Yes, he was. Anyways, so I told him, I said, so what do you really want to do? Does God factor into your success in tennis? And, oh, yeah. And I says, oh, how would that be? And he says, well, I'd love to win a major and then God, God, give God the glory. I said, oh, that's awesome. But I said, it doesn't work that way. He says, what do you mean? I said, if you can't give God the glory now, you won't be given the opportunity to give glory later because you failed on the basic level. So I said, you got to start giving God the glory now. And I says, and furthermore, what that does for you, it gives you confidence because it's no longer the size of your plan in life. It's, it's, it's bigger than the size of your city in terms of plan. It's bigger than your country. It's the size of the universe because you're working with God. So I said, when you play tennis, you'll play with so much confidence. Win or lose, doesn't matter. You've got confidence because you know why you're doing it. So you're going to play way better. I wasn't for sure on that, but I was pretty sure enough where it made it look like a fact. So anyways, <laughs> so then, <laughs> so then, so we're all the way down to Texas, we're talking, and he's just loving it. And I happened to have gotten a free Gideon Bible at a bluegrass festival a week before. I had thrown it in my backpack. I guess it's him, man, start now. You've got to spend an hour a day reading that. Change your life. He's a young guy. He doesn't have time for that, probably. 
But I said, just start reading it. Oh, yeah, well, thanks. Anyways, so he's going to be gone for a whole week. He already told me his plans. What university he's going to? Texas, one of them was first, and then all the way across through to Florida, you know, getting all these people want him. So, so I, I challenged him. I said, do that. I said, and, and just start giving God the glory now. It's going to give you confidence. It's getting a competitive edge over everybody else. Cool, this is awesome. I mean, I'm so glad I met you. I got his number. I got, you know, his dad is the, is the vice president of, of um, oh, Costco, not Costco, the, whatever, Costco shipping. Whatever, big. Not the Costco where you buy your pecans from. If I pronounce that right in the States, excuse me. But anyways, pecans. Because <laughs> some people say that, but whatever. So anyway, so see, his dad's a VP based in Vancouver, British Columbia, running the Pacific Rim from Vancouver. So anyways, so I go, and, uh, and I go do my, mine was a business trip. I wasn't speaking that trip because I owned a major share in a plant in Texas, recycling batteries. So I'm, I'm down there. I was expecting to be gone four days. I bought my return ticket four days. Two days in, I'm done. I don't want to spend my time down in West Texas, so I go to the airport and ask, can I get on standby to go back home? Yeah, there's probably room, so, so I wait around. Sure enough, there's room. I get on standby, but it's a night flight, you know, one of them 11 o'clock at night things. So, fine. So two days after I get down there, I'm back on the airplane, two and a half days, whatever. I get on the airplane and uh, get a blanket and a pillow because this is, you know, a few hour flight up to uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. So, so anyway, so I'm from, from Dallas. So I just get nestled in. The lights go dim in the airplane because we take off. And just before I fall asleep, because I took my gravel tablet. Okay, I cheat a little now and then when I'm traveling. Gravel is sort of like a poor man's sleeping pill. Just helps you get to sleep. You know, I don't want to lay awake all night. Don't watch the movies and stuff. So I'm sitting there ready to go. And I, I open my eye, and here's this young guy walking down the aisle in the darkened airplane, a little bit of light. And I thought... That's the kid I flew with two days ago. <laughs> but I'm not sure. It's kind of dark in here. But, but wait a second, he's gone for a whole week. And this is two days later. So I'm thinking about this for a second. And I thought, ah, you know, I'd make a fool of myself if I thought it was him and it's not him. So I'm, I'm crafty. So I thought, here's what I'll do. I'll have my head down, and as he gets to me, I'll just say his name. Rashawn is his name. So... He gets coming down the aisle and he gets about here. And I say, hey, Rashawn! Guy stops dead. So I thought, yeah, maybe it is him. I look up. He said, it's you! <laughs> and I said, wait a second. What are you doing here? Oh, man, I can't tell you what happened. He sits on the armrest across from the aisle and starts telling me the old experience. He lands in Texas. They pick him up with a limousine. The vice president of the university is there. They're putting on the dog for this kid. Vice President of the University is there. They, um, <clears throat> they cart him back to the university, and the whole way back, this VP is asking Rashawn, what's your real goals in life? He says, oh, I want to represent God. He says, oh, that's amazing. He says, we've got what's called Campus Crusade for Christ here. You would love them. And so they get back, immediately usher him into all the big shots, the PE department and all these heads of different departments. So they're just putting on the dog for this kid. And so, so they start asking him all these questions. And he says, no, he says, I'm a Christian. I want to represent God. And the one PE teacher says, well, get, if you run right now, you'll catch Campus Crusade. They're down there praying in the gym right now. It was it Campus Crusades or Christian Athletes, I think it was called. So he runs, they, they uh, take him down there to the gym, and here's all these kids praying. He gets in the prayer group. He said, that was it. I decided I'm staying here. Next day, the day after he lands, the day before he gets on the plane, he goes to play tennis. He said, I have never played so good in my life. Amen. And he says, I get it, man. I get it. Gave me a whole bunch of other details. So then, so, so we get back to Vancouver. A couple weeks later, I got his number, but I, I haven't taken the time to phone him. A couple weeks later, I get a phone call one evening, and I gave him my phone number, Rashawn. I get this phone call one evening, and this guy's on. He's got an accent, Asian accent, and he's talking to me. He says, are, are you uh, Mr. Larson? Yeah, Herb Larson, yeah. 
And he says, well, he says, I am so-and-so. And I'm trying to put it together who this is. You know, like, I don't, I don't know this guy, but whatever. And he says, I'm Rashawn's dad. I said, oh, the tennis player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, what do I owe you? And I says, uh, what do you mean, what do you owe me? He says, you have changed my son's life. What do I owe you? And I says, I don't want anything. And he says, um, no, no, no. I've got to give you something. I mean, his life is so changed. He's just, oh, it's unbelievable. What could I give you? I says, I don't want anything. He says, no, but I have to. And he won't give up. I'm half German, half Norwegian, so I'm bullheaded and stubborn. At least that's what my wife says. But anyhow, that's my nationalities. But, you know, like, I don't know if that's true. But so anyways, so I said, so I'm thinking, okay, he, he's not going to give up. So I said, okay, there is something that you could do for me. Oh, really? What is it? He's probably thinking money or whatever. I said, well, you know, as someone who designs and builds equipment for a living, I said, I would love to get into the belly of one of them ships and get right in there with the pistons and everything and have a look at what one of them engines are like on them big freighter ships. And he's quiet for a bit. He says, well, that's no problem. I said, well, that's what I would like. Well, no problem. You just tell me when and we'll send you it on the belly of a ship. <laughs> but, but the point is, is, is the abundant life is these spontaneous things that happen. They're called divine appointments. I love divine appointments because you, you can't plan them. And so I'm this sort of like, Coming out, yeah, that's the exciting life. Yeah, I haven't really planned for this, but let's see what happens. That's what working for Jesus is all about. And see, we make it all complicated, the whole witnessing thing. I'll get into that now. I wasn't planning on it. Well, maybe I'll leave that to the next meeting, if I even remember it. But anyways, so tell you another story, because this stuff just, this is what fuels me. This is what keeps me awake at night. You know, just, I love divine appointments. And they happen all the time, and they're the most exciting thing you will ever encounter. And there's nothing complicated about it. I get a phone call one day. And I knew immediately, within three seconds, it's a salesman. You know, I get lots of calls from salesmen. And this guy say, so how would I know that? Okay, you say, this guy's brilliant. How would he figure that out? Okay. Here's how I knew right away as a salesman. Because first of all, he says, hey, Herbert! Well, I'm Herb to everybody that knows me, so... I'm not Herbert, so he saw my name somewhere in full, so I know, I don't know this guy, he's a salesman, but carried on, he says, hey Herbert, uh, what are you up to today? That's a salesman. And so I'm listening to him, he says, hey, I'm the new representative for the blah, blah, blah brand of pneumatics. Pneumatics is like air cylinders and solenoids for making things happen, because I do mechanical engineering, so that's what we do. So, so I buy theirs, they're made in Japan, they're high-end, I love it. You know, they've eclipsed the German technology, you know, quality, Siemens and all them. So I buy from them. So he says, I'm the new sales manager. And I says, cool, cool, nice to know. I could give a rip. I just keep ordering for the last 20 years and I'll keep ordering. So, so he says, any chance we can get together for, for, for lunch today? And I says, no, tied up. Sorry, I don't have time. Because it's salesman, right? I just didn't need to because I'm not going to change my mind. So anyways, he says, how about coffee then? I says, no, I, like I'm, I'm busy. Sorry, I, I just don't have any time. And so I thought, got rid of him. I was nice, but I got rid of him. Guess what? Next day, hey, Herbert! <laughs> Same sales pitch. Can we go for lunch today? No, sorry. Uh, I don't have time. Sorry, no. Well, how about coffee then? Just coffee. I said, no, but let me tell you something. I love your product. There's nothing you're going to do to convince me to buy more or less. I'll just con I'm a loyal customer. I'll keep buying from you. So don't worry about it, okay? Neat. So that should be the end of the meeting. No, the next day. Hey, Herbert. <laughs> Every day that week, he phones me with the same questions, and I blow him off. But by Friday, I really let him have it. I says, look, you don't get it. I don't have time to do this. I like your product. Leave it at that. Glad to know your name. This is cool. So, but I said, sorry, I don't have any time. So I thought, that urgency should have got him. Next week, he waited a couple of days. I was nice. I think it's probably Tuesday or something. Hey, Herbert. 
And uh, it was just, it was, it was unbelievable. See, what did he do that, that call? What did he tell me that week? I'm trying to remember now what he said that week. But anyways, I basically blew him off again. Didn't want anything to do with it. And then, oh, I know what he said. He said, okay, guess what? I'm in your part of the country. His, his office is an hour from where I am. He says, I'm in your part of the town today. Good, phone CBC News. They'd probably love to publish that. You know, like, I don't really care. So he says, I'm in your area today. And I says, yeah, nice. And he says, any chance we can get for lunch? I says, you know, I'm in the middle of writing a contract right now. I write my own contracts. And I don't want any disruption because, you know, you miss something and it could cost you. So I'm, I'm thinking, I'm writing. I says, I'm in the middle of writing. I don't have any time. Sorry. Well, how about coffee? And I said, you know, I'm thinking about this. And I thought, what's wrong with this guy? Where, what school did he go to? I mean... Anybody with any sense of pride at a minimum would have just said, forget it. This guy's closed. He's not gonna, I'm not getting anywhere. But no, this guy wanted to keep going. So then, so I just pretty much just, I said, I was going to vote race, said he no, and I thought, say no, and then I just thought, well, whew, he's awfully persistent. Hmm, wonder if one of these are divine appointments. <laughs> so I said, tell you what. When you're done your appointments here in Abbotsford, because that's the suburb of Vancouver I live in, I said, when you're done your appointments here, give me a call, and if I'm done or if I'm in a natural break point or whatever, I'll see if, if I have time to go out for coffee. So, one hour, I get back to work. One hour later, my phone rings. Well, if his office is an hour from mine, what does that mean? He drove straight to my place, phoned me. Hey, I'm here. <laughs> and, I, and I look at my watch, and I think, that was an hour ago he phoned me. So I said, well, like I told you, go to your other appointments. And when, you're, you know, and when you're done those, give me a buzz. And he says, oh, well, he's fumbling around all the phone. I realize he doesn't have another appointment. He just gambled. So I thought, oh, man. So I said, okay, tell you what, I'll meet at Tim Hortons. Like Tim Hortons is the holy grail of coffee shops in Canada. They're nothing. They're just little places. Why do I like going to coffee shops for meetings? I got a nice office with a view of Mount Baker and all that kind of stuff. I don't do anything there. I do it all in coffee shops for a number of reasons. I'll tell you why. Number one, if they come to my office and I'm tired of listening to them, how do I get them out of there? Okay, you're done. Your sales pitch. See you later. Yeah, that makes it awkward. And I'm not a totally bad guy, but close sometimes. But anyway, so, so I'm... But if I go to a coffee shop, two things happen. Number one, I can get up and go whenever I want, and they can spend the rest of the afternoon if they want there. Secondly, and, and I think most of you might understand this, but if you don't, coffee is the universal smell of socializing. Coffee is the universal smell of socializing. You know what it says? We're friends. The smell says we're friends. A friend of mine who's a pastor in, in South New Zealand, we are talking about this on the phone one day, he's pretty out there type of a guy, you know, he was a layman who turned pastor. He's on the conference payroll and everything. But anyways, so he says, you know what I would call that? That's olfactory evangelism, <laughs> meaning smell evangelism. So anyways, because what happens when I get there, that smell alone says we're amongst friends for them. So I said, tell you what, I'll meet you at the Whatcom exit Tim Hortons, which is five minutes from my office. So... I immediately grab my coat, I go to the truck, I jump in, I head down, and, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I, I missed one detail. Okay, he phoned me, the, the second week he phoned me, here's what, he said, where are you today? That's what he asked me. I got to get this detail in here. So I did meet him. He said, where are you today? And I said, I'm a job site in, this, in the part of the city where he's at. Oh, can't I just meet you? And I thought, okay, he's one of these guys like to be warm, fuzzy, you know, just Shake hands, change cards, blah, blah, blah. So I said, here's where I'll be at. He comes down. I borrowed, I got someone else's coveralls. The name was Grant. I remember that. And so I had these other coveralls. And this guy comes up with a nice SUV. And he's got nice shoes on. And he's tiptoeing around through, you know, because we're in a concrete plant. And so he comes over and he says, hey, Grant, where's Herbert? And I says, well, I'm Herb. Oh, that took him back because he thought he had it all figured out, you know. So... So he says, oh man, nice to meet you. So I let him know what my name really is to everybody else. I shook his hand. I said, you know, it's really good to meet you, man. I'm, I'm, in the future, it's good to see a face to the position. 
Cool. Here's my card. He gives me his card and a tag sheet of what they sell. I know that. I've been telling you that on the phone all. So anyways, so I says, got to go. He says, hey, it's noon right now. Why don't we go for lunch? I says, we're in the middle of install. We got the whole plant shut down. And all these big shots are standing around here waiting when it's going to start up again. I don't have time. And then he gets brassy. He says, well, don't you eat lunch? And I says, if I don't need to, I don't eat lunch. I don't really care. So nice to meet you, man. See you later. And I just turned around and walked away. That's the, so the next week, now we're going to the coffee shop. So I'd already met this guy. So I go straight from my office down to Tim Hortons. I walk in the door. What do I see? He's already there with his coffee. And the disgusting part of it all was he took one of the best seats in the house. What do I mean by that? Because I'm the, when I go to a restaurant or whatever it is, I like to sit in a corner so I can watch all the action. It's just entertaining for me. I don't want to sit with my back to all the action and look at a wall. Well, here, and that, and that Tim Hortons, here's a brick wall. The people that it serve are over here. And there's a chair here, another chair over there, a table here, like a bar, uh, not a bar, but a bench is on each side of a table. He's sitting on this side, so his back's against the wall. Well, what's that going to do to me? I've got to look at a brick wall or him. So I go up, I order my decaf, double cream. Yeah, I have cream. So I go get my decaf, double cream. I go walking back, and I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. So I sit down. So I, uh, how do you start a conversation? I don't know. So I said, so what's up? You know what he says right off the bat? I Googled you. For, for some of you who are low-tech like me, Google, you can go online, you can look people's names up, you can look things up, you can get anything you want. So he goes on the internet and looks my name up. He says, you're a very interesting person. Well, I don't know how to react now. It's like, oh, really? So I'm like, where do I go from here? He says, well, here's the deal. I got a problem. And I thought, yeah, I know that. You didn't have to explain that to me. <laughs> and he says, and this is what he says. He says, uh, I'm an atheist. I thought, well, now I know you have a problem. You know, no, I, I'm, I'm really good with atheists because I, you know, atheists aren't as, we think they're stupid. They got discernment way more than sometimes we do. Because, and I've told many atheists this. I never used to meet atheists. Now I meet them all the time. I tell them this. I said, you know, you have based your judgment on probably really good data. See, an atheist becomes an atheist. Probably 70% of the atheists I meet, because I always ask them this, if they've had a religious exposure in their life. And 70% of them had a, a religious exposure in their life. So they left God. So why did they leave God? And I reinforce the atheists in this. And I have to say, don't look at an atheist, they're stupid. They have built a very good decision to become an atheist based on very good data. Where'd they get the data? from you and me as Christians. They didn't get it from the Bible. They got it from us as Christians. So I might talk a little tongue-in-cheek, but so anyways, this guy tells me he's an atheist, and he says, here's the problem I'm having. My wife is a staunch Presbyterian Christian. And he goes into the whole story, how they started dating. He's an atheist. She's a Presbyterian. She's the head secretary of their Presbyterian church. Somehow they got pregnant before they got married. And he said the church fired her and they basically ostracized her and she still goes to church. And on top of it now, she's taken my kids to church and my kids are loving it. My problem is this, I don't want my kids to grow up believing this garbage and one day wake up to the fact that there's no God. Well, that's an interesting problem. And so... So, and the story is a lot longer than that. He's telling me everything, so I'm listening to this whole story, and, and I don't know where to go from Meanwhile, I forgot this detail. I sit down. I look at him when I started my conversation. You know, guys don't like to look into each other's eyes. just not a cool thing, you know? So, so you're looking around, you know what I mean? It's like, mm, yeah. But sitting over here was this well-dressed, relatively attractive woman sitting over here, 10, 15 feet away from me. So I either looking at him or glance around. I glance at her. She's looking at me. Oh, that was awkward. Okay, so I'm not going to look there anymore. But then, but then in the middle of this conversation, I don't want to just, you know, eye to eye with this guy. So I'm looking around. Brick, 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 brick. Oh, oh she's looking. Oh, that was awkward. So I had all these awkward like 20, 30 times. I'm not interested in her. I got nowhere else to look. So this goes on and on. So anyways, so he tells me his whole story. And I says, can I ask you a question? 
have you ever had any religious exposure? He says, oh yeah. Well, now we can deal with a little, once you know that. So I said, well, what's your background? He says, well, he says, I went to a Catholic school when I was young. Oh, I did the, all that stuff. And I said, and what happened? He said, I woke up to the fact one day there's no God. And I says, really, how do you know? I said, I'm assuming you kind of got burned by the church you're going to or whatever else. So how do you know you're not throwing God out like the baby with the bathwater? No, 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 no. There is no God. And I'm realizing, okay, this guy's asking me questions to help him to stay on his track of being an atheist while his wife wants to be a Christian. So, so I ask him a few more questions. We get chatting about it. And I thought, it's time to tell him my testimony. So I share my whole testimony of chasing things and money and success and blah, 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 blah. Told him the whole testimony. He's got nothing else to do. I'm telling and, and I'm not going to quit. So I just tell him it takes 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, whatever. I'm telling my whole testimony. Meanwhile, as I'm talking, I glance over. Oh, the woman's looking at me. I'm looking at her. She looks away quick. I look away quick. This whole thing's getting really awkward. <clears throat> and so, so, I'm, so I'm telling him my whole story. And, you know, just be, uh, subconsciously, oh, another one of them again. So, so anyways, we're, so I'm telling him the whole story. And then I start getting into it. I says, so I, so I started challenging him. I said, well, here's what I find interesting. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. But I said, um, <clears throat> the Bible is the most controversial. I said, do you believe that the Bible is the textbook for Christians? He said, oh, yeah. I said, well, what I find interesting is the most controversial piece of literature ever written in history. Everywhere it is, there's controversy. There's still arguments whether the Bible belongs in the libraries of public high schools in North America. Fight, 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 always over the Bible. World wars have been virtually started over the Bible. So I said, what I don't understand is this. Um, those people who are against the Bible say that it's fictitious and a myth. So I said, what I don't understand is this. If it's fake, if it's fictitious, it's a myth, what is the threat to society? I just don't understand it. And I said, in fact, my King James Version Bible belongs on the shelf right next to Shakespearean writing in the same kind of language as literature with no more threat to society than Shakespearean writing because it's fiction. He's like, hmm, never thought of that before. So he's starting to think. So when he was covered a whole, there's a lot of things I cover with atheists. I got to get on the story. But, so, I'm, so I'm sharing a whole bunch of things. It's logic. See, they need logic. And they need logic in such a way that they can buy into it. And when they want to bellyache about Christians, I agree with everything I can that they say. Does two things. One, it just diminishes their fight. Number two is, is, is they, uh, well, it diminishes their fight. And number two, you're elevating them to the point where they can't, how, how can they fight anymore? You know, I'm agreeing with them. Because believe it or not, a good chunk of what they say is true. I've had atheists say, who could ever follow a God that dangles you over a fire and burns this? Oh man, you are so discerning. I, I can't believe how discerning you are. You're so right. Where's that argument? Just ended. Oh, this Christians are so hypocritical. They say this and they do that. And you see, what I'm, I said, oh man, un, I, I agree with you completely. And you know what? After a while, if they, if they say, you know, God's real or, or not real, I'm not going to say God's dead, but here's what I say all the time. And I told this guy multiple times. I said, whether God is real or not is totally irrelevant, because here's what I got into. I said, now I, what I want to tell you about is this. Let's look at our belief systems, okay? Sure. I says, I'll tell you what I believe. And now whether God is real or not is totally irrelevant. This is what I believe. So this is what I believe. I believe that I was created. Now I can't prove that. But you know what that does for me? If I was created, there's a small chance that maybe there's a reason for my existence, a purpose. I say, you know what I do with that feeling of reason or purpose? I gain confidence from that. I gain boldness. I have a competitive edge over everybody else in business because the belief system says there's a reason for my life. Amen. But I can't prove any of that. Whether God's real or not, it's totally irrelevant. And I said, secondly, I go through life you know, believing that there's a reason and purpose, I, I feed off that and it helps me in life. I said, at the end of my life, I look forward to eternal life. So what does that give me? That gives me hope today. So that at the end of it all, 
So I got hope today. At the end of it all, I have something to look forward to. So I get something out of it today, sense of purpose, accomplishment, whatever, and at the end of it all, I hope. Down end of the dark tunnel, I see light. So I said, whether God's real or not, doesn't matter. Now, can I share what you believe? And he said, yeah, sure, go ahead. I said, here's what you believe. You, be lo- you believe you all evolved from a lower, lower form of animal life. I said, you know what that does for you? Slams the door. There's any reason whatsoever for your existence. And I said, I'll tell you what your life's like. Because he's a manager, obviously, he's been pounding hard up the ladder, right? So I said, I'll tell you what your life is like. Your life is nothing but a rat race. Survival of the fittest, just like evolution says. Survival of the fittest. You're going through life trying to accumulate, make more money, do all this stuff. So there's no reason whatsoever for your existence because you just evolved into it. And you're going through life trying to hold it all together so at the end of it all, while you're trying to hold all your assets, your toys, and your things together, you get to the other end of it and you die, you rot in the ground, and all your family and friends fight over your assets. That's all you have. So I said, whether God's real or not, it doesn't even matter. It's irrelevant. My belief system gives me something today. Yours gives nothing. And he's listening to this. And so, so, and he's not saying much now. I can tell the gears are working. And I says, hey, tell you what. We all go through crossroads or, 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 or we have to make decisions every day in life. We either go left or we go right. I said, in business, I have to make decisions all day long. And I said, but here's how I make my decisions. I said, a decision is this. You either go this way or this way. I said, here's the way I make my decisions. I look at it and I say, well, if, if I go this direction, what's the downside and what's the upside of that decision? So I, so I look at it this way. I said, if the downside is not much risk and the upside is great, I'll probably go that way. So I said, let me put it a little more simple. So I said this. I said, if a stockbroker comes to you and, and says, um, buy this stock for $10 because in two months it's going to be worth $1,000. Okay? It's decision time, right? Yeah, yeah, he gets it. I said, okay. So he says, buy this stock for $10 because in two months all the analysts say it'll be worth $1,000. So I said, now let's do the upside down. Set. The downside is what? I lose 10 bucks, yeah, because I could make $990. So I said, I'm going to go on it because the downside is nothing compared to the upside. So I said, no, but no. I said, what if the stockbroker comes and he says, buy this stock for $10 because all the analysts say that in two months it's going to be worth $11. <laughs> Decision time. The downside is I might lose my 10 bucks. The upside is I might gain $1. Now that's a good investment, right? I would do that if I had a guarantee of that, but whatever. But for the point I made this, I said, so the downside is, is I could lose it. The upside is I'll only make a dollar on that risk. Yeah, probably wouldn't do it. I said, I don't know, but the way I see it, you're at a crossroads, man. You're at the point of decision. Now let me help you with the downside. The downside is you're only going to spend one, because that's all I'm asking you to do, get a Bible. Your Bible, obviously got a Bible at home. I said, get a Bible. I said, your downside is you're going to spend an hour a day reading it. Treat it as literature. You don't have to believe God's real. Just assume he might be. That's no commitment. So I said, just get a Bible, read it for an hour a day. That's the downside. The upside is, what if I'm right? He looks at me and he says, I have never thought about I says, you give up no money. You're risking an hour a day reading literature that's very interesting. So he says, wow. I get it. I get it. I'm not risking anything. I said, no, but I'll guarantee in two months your life is going to be just unbelievable. Meanwhile, I'm having all these awkward glances at this woman over here. Like I said, 30, 40 times, I don't know how many times. It was getting pretty tough. So then, so he says, oh, yeah, why? Okay, well, what should I read in the Bible? So, of course, they want to know that. You know, you start at the beginning. No, I don't want him to start in Genesis because when he hits the begats, what's going to happen? Same thing that happens to me. Wall. Now, how do we get around this wall? Well, we might give up, try again some other time. So, so I said, okay, well, do you have a piece of paper? No, I don't have a piece of paper. Do you have a pen? Yeah, I got a pen. So we take a serviette, napkin, whatever you want to call it, out of the thing there, and I start writing text. I want him to read Deuteronomy 28. The blessings against the curses. Yeah, it could be a bit heavy theologically, whatever, but I want him to do that. Gave him some texts and John to read and all that. So I said, go get a Bible, read these. 
as I'm writing these things down, and this, was, this whole thing was my whole afternoon, okay? Didn't have time for them, but whole afternoon, no. So I'm writing these down on this napkin. Out of my peripheral vision, what do I see? This woman, and what, what, we're there an hour and a half, and she's, her coffee cup has been empty for probably an hour and 20 minutes. And she stays there and allows us to have all these awkward glances. So I'm writing these things down, and I see out of our peripheral vision, she gets up. Instead of walking out, she walks right over our table. She says, I am so sorry to interrupt you. I know it's probably rude of me. But she says, I've been sitting over there listening to you for the last hour and a half. I so want what you're offering him. Would you write this stuff down for me as well? Almost brings tears to my eyes because... I laid awake a number of nights thinking about this. My imagination wouldn't let me down on this one. Because here's what I see. That woman was in God's crosshairs at the foundation of the earth. My obnoxious sales manager was in the crosshairs of Jesus from the foundation of the earth. They knew at that day in the future, somehow we have to organize this, orchestrate it, so he gets the best seat all in five minutes from the phone call, already seated. She has to be seated there. And then there's this guy by the name of Herb. He builds equipment for concrete. He really knows how to make the stuff good. His head is like a concrete block. In the future, we're going to have to use the jackhammer on him for three weeks. Hopefully, he can make enough of a crack to let the Holy Spirit in. This is all planned from the foundation of the earth. And so I go down there, He's got the good seat. I'm having a pity party. She's seat, sitting over there so she can see and hear me talk. Yes, we had lots of very uncomfortable glances all hour and a half. But I look at that, and I figure, how many times would you have to roll the dice to come up with the odds of that happening by chance? You could not roll the dice enough times to come up with that by chance. That is a divine appointment put together at the foundation of the world. But that, my friends, is what working for Jesus is all about. That is the thrill of it. To just, to just relive every moment of it, every bit of the conversation. I came home from that and my wife says, write it down now. Oh no, I'm busy. You gotta write it down now. Because my wife just drives me on this stuff because I don't remember half this stuff. Stuff will happen and then I'll say, oh yeah, you know, I feel a bit flat lately. And she says, well, yesterday. Oh, that's right. You know, my mind, it just, it just goes to this stuff. So, so I gotta go sit down, spend, you know, 45 minutes typing all the details of what happened out, which I'm glad that she pushes me. But anyways, but the point is, is that kind of stuff, I don't know how to explain it. Of all the chasing I've done in life for things and money and more people to work under me and all this kind of stuff, nothing has ever compared to that kind of stuff. It is the ultimate. I mean, it's just all I can say. But the other point is this. Oh, yeah, okay, but you got gifts or whatever. No, forget it. I'm sorry. People say, oh, you can speak. I couldn't speak before. I was scared spitless when I was first asked to get up and speak at a church. I said no. I said no lots of times. I'm not saying I'm nothing in anything now. I'm just saying that, you know, you just give it over to God and what happens? And so this happens to me all the time. I'm flying off somewhere in the world to do something utterly crazy. And I get to thinking, what am I doing? I'm not even anywhere near qualified this. When was our next meeting? What's the deal here? Well, what, should we just go through and forget about the, uh, whatever? I mean, what, what, do, what do you know? Let, quit. Oh, hey, whatever. Okay, so 10 minutes, we'll take a five minute. Anyway, so, so I get a phone call one day, just for an example. And they, because I'm on my way to Australia. I've been there 18 times, speaking to all our camp meetings and pastoral retreats and stuff. And I'm down there going to uh, speak, speak at a camp meeting. And I get this phone call, and they said, Would you be interested in entertaining an invitation? To what? I mean, I'm used to speaking in Sunday churches. That's not a problem. But, you know, they're kind of like, ugh. So I said, like, what's the invitation? They said, you wouldn't believe we got a call from the Muslim, you know, the, the Muslims here. The Amman wants you to come and speak in his mosque. What? 
And I, and I was, of course, I don't know anything about them. So I was going to say no. So then I'm just thinking, oh, yeah, there's just no way. This is a Friday night when they all meet. And I don't know much about the details, but they just invited me to come and speak there. This Amon did. PhD. And so, so I'm thinking, oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I think you've got to do it. I mean, that's got to be one of them divine appointments you talk about. Well, now I'm had. So I said, well, I guess so. So I get off the phone call. I'm freaked right out. So I go down to the Christian bookstore and buy everything I can get on Islam. And I made an amazing discovery. I didn't know that Islam was the religion of Muslims. I, I'm being honest. That, that's how unqualified I was. I didn't even know that, you know, because Islam is the religion of Muslims. So that's something I learned right off the bat. And I thought, whoa, what am I doing going down there? I don't even know this about them. So I'm reading these books. And they're just depressing. They're just like, Phew, throw, 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 whatever. So I couldn't get anywhere. And this is coming up in two months. And I'm just like, oh, man, I can't do this. What did I say yes for? This is ridiculous. Why would they phone me? And so then I'm, I'm trying to get through this whole thing. So I phone, I phone the general conference. I got lots of people there. I couldn't get a warm body in a whole hour. That poor secretary. Well, try the. Oh, no, they're not in. Sure, not there. No. Well, let's see if we can get a hold of this. No, they're not there. It was whole hour, nothing. So I phoned the North American Division. Phone them. No warm body in another hour. Few promises to have someone phone me back. I don't hear anything for a whole week. I'm on the banks of my local river fishing. My phone rings. Now, that should I get it? Because what if it falls out and drops in the drink? But I back up a few steps. I put, here, it's, here it's a guy from North American Division. He says, because I don't know what I'm doing. I, I need help, right? I'm just a layman. I don't know anything about this. So the guy says, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we hear you want us to phone you back. Um, yeah. Um, well, I'll see if I can find someone. Never did hear from anybody after that. And I'm not, not blaming them. It was a good thing, okay? This was providential that I didn't get anybody. Because I'm, I'm chasing, I'm chasing, trying to find information. I can't find anything. And then a week before I go down there, I get a, I'm taking my dad to a hockey game. And so, so I'm just coming up to the arena, and my phone rings. And here it's a conference call. Some guys from Washington, D.C., some guys from Andrews University, a kid from Southern University, and all the Australian guys that are working on this. And we're having a conference call. So I told my dad, here's your ticket. Go in, you know, I'll, I'll come in in a bit. So I take the phone call, and he says, hey, Herb, we're totally excited. We can't wait for you to get here, blah, blah, blah. What are you going to talk about? I said, I don't have a clue. They said, oh, no, you've got to be kidding me. No, I don't have a clue. And they says, oh, yeah, you know, we can't let this opportunity go. And I says, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm coming up flat. I don't even know what to talk about. I don't even know much about these people. And there's two lay people that had opened this whole thing up originally. Uh, what are their names? Oh, shoot, Carl and... Um, sorry, guys, if you happen to see this. But anyways, they did a remarkable work to open this contact originally up. But anyway, so, so we're on this conference call, and then there's this young, younger voice gets on. Carl, his name's Carl. He's from Australia. He's going to Southern. He gets on there and he says, um, can I say something? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Say. He says, well, you know, here's the way I look at it. Uh, Herb, you didn't get yourself invited. This is something God did, so why would you worry about it? Don't plan anything. And I want to tell you something. If somebody would have given me a bunch of... Because after all these... I went there three times over a year and a half. Every six months I'm down at this mosque. Anyways, if somebody had given me all this information, it would have been a disaster. Probably. You know, because it wouldn't have been the Holy Spirit. I've been trying to cram something. So I'm glad somebody didn't phone me. So don't get me thinking, oh, the general conference didn't do their thing. No, God was closing them from talking because this is what he needed. So, so I fly down there. And you know what? I had no stress. Because this is what I do to myself all the time. To get over stress. I say... I'm not qualified for any of this, number one. I know that. Number two, I got invited. Got to be a divine thing, because who am I? I'm just some twit from a back street in British Columbia. So, so then I look at it this way. Here's what really gets the stress off me. If this flops, who cares? I don't get paid to do it anyways. I mean, it's, <laughs> if it flops, who gives a rip? And if it goes great, it's only God. That's why I don't use notes. I mean, it's just let it up to God. So I, so I go down there and we go to the mosque. And then I find out this guy leads all the Sufi Muslims in the world. They took their headquarters out of the Middle East and brought it down to Sydney. 
400 million followers, and these talks are going to be broadcast on Muslim television. Who am I? I am nobody. Let me assure you. My wife would say, yeah, 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 amen, amen. What else do you want to know? <laughs> so, so the thing is, is so, I, so we get to the mosque, and, uh, and everybody's got their shoes off there. Well, so I go to, oh, no, 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 you're a guest. You don't have to do that. Oh, no, that's okay. I'll take them off. So I take them off, and they said, can we get you anything? Can we get any? Oh, I said, you know, if you can get me somewhere to pray. I've got to pray right now. Oh, no problem. They've got a prayer room. So they haul me off to a prayer room. It's not going to be a long prayer because five minutes, I'm up. So I just raise my hand. I say, God, in the name of Jesus, it's showtime. That's the word I used. I said, it's all in your hands. I have no idea what's going to happen. It's, you take it. And I just thought, why worry about it? So I get up, I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, stress is coming a little bit now. I hope you come through. And as soon as I get up, the first thing that wants to come out of my mouth is my testimony. I share my whole testimony in front of all these Muslims. And then, and then all of a sudden, because I, I did learn this much, that they're okay with the first five books of the Bible for sure. And later on I learned that the Gospels are okay, the Injil. So, so anyway, so I thought Deuteronomy, hey, that's there. So I bring up Deuteronomy. How did that come up? Holy Spirit just said, here, talk about Deuteronomy. The blessings and the curses. And it just, the whole thing flowed and everybody just like, and I'm listening to the sermon. This is what tells you it's the Holy Spirit. You have no idea what you're going to say next. You just listen along with everybody else. Honestly, I'm, I'm not, this isn't being facetious. That's the way it is. And I'm just sitting there like I'm amazed at the stuff that's coming out and I don't even know what I'm talking about. And so when it's all done, these people, they're just like, just, just mob. And, and one of my friends in Australia brought his nice big camera along and didn't find, did, they don't like cameras in there, we didn't know that. So then everybody wanted pictures, so I'm taking pictures with everybody, all the, all the people there, and he's snapping all the pictures, and finally the, some guy comes and says, just so you know, we really don't like cameras in here, and yet there's broadcast cameras. So, you know, still shots, broadcast, what's the difference? Anyway, so... Anyways, there's a woman that came that night, the, the conference, the division, some division leaders were there, conference leaders were there, because nobody had a clue, including me. I'm the biggest clueless one of the bunch, what's going on here. So then, one of the women there comes, she's very wealthy, she owns nursing homes down there, she says, comes up to the Amman, says, what would you think if I bought every one of your members a really high quality Bible? Would you be okay with that? He says, that'd be awesome. He invites me that night to come back down six months later. Back down. This time he wants me, and my wife comes down because she's like, What's going on here? You know, because she said, Don't do it. Don't do it. I don't want you to do it. Something's up. And so then she comes down. And so, so we get invited over to the Amon's house. And he's got this huge mansion. So we drive up. My friend drives me up. We drive to the address. Time before we just went right to the mosque. Now we're at his house. We start to open our door, and all these guys come out of the houses around there. And they come right over. Who are you? What do you want? They bought all the houses around the Amman to protect because there's fighting, infighting between Shiites and, and uh, Sufis and Sunnis. And so they all come over. Well, I'm, I'm invited. Well, I, who are you? I'm Herb Larson. Are you the Seventh-day Adventist guy? Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> right to his house door. He doesn't come to the door. They open the door. Usher my wife and I in. We go sit down. They have refreshments for us and everything else. And then I start to find more background stuff. Guess what? This guy's had three dreams. And in his dream, a being would tell him, a being would tell him, because see, they're always looking for who is the, oh, crumb, what's, what do they call it? Um, people of the book. They've always been trying to figure, because the people of the book points to Christians. But they hate evangelicals. Why? Because evangelicals prophecy says that Israel is going to be, you know, taken over and all that. So they don't want anything to do with evangelicals. So all Christians are lumped in the same. They got a problem because they can never figure out who the people of the book is. And so in his dream, all three times, different dreams, different people, said the Seventh-day Adventist church are the people of the book. And, and get this, I got to back up. The two young laymen, okay, yeah, can I tell that part of the story? I've got to give them the credit. I mean, this is where it all started. One of them, oh, 
can't remember his name, senior stuff. But anyways, he goes to a government building. There's big lines of people. I don't know what, what it was. I can't remember what it's for. Big lines of people. And there's, there's you pay at the, at the cash register. I can't even remember what this was for, as if it was automotive or what it was. But he's in line. Rodney, Rodney, that's his name, Rodney. So Rodney goes up in line, and he sees this well-dressed, attractive woman in a full scarf, and knowing she's Muslim, no mask over here, but she's, she's, she's up in the line, and they come to the front at the same time. She gets talking to the person that she's dealing with, and Rodney's right next to her. And so, so she gets talking to him, or to the clerk, and the clerk is rude, really rude. And, and this woman, and she said, that's $50. She says, oh, I didn't realize there any charge. I'm the ambassador for Egypt, I mean, so I'm the ambassador for, for Egypt to Australia. So here, this is an ambassador woman. She didn't bring any money with her. She just came there and knew a pointy. She says, well, I don't have any money. And she just waited a half an hour, an hour in this line. And so Rodney's doing his thing, listening to her. And she says, well, I'm sorry. I mean, you know, like, like I'm here. I, I'm part of the government, whatever. No, it doesn't matter. You don't have the money, leave. Come back when you got money. So she's just like, doesn't know what to do. Rodney steps out of his booth, comes over there, and Rodney doesn't have any money. He's working under his car probably an hour to make it run five hours. You know what I mean? So he goes over and plops down the $50 for her. And so she's like, what? Oh, no, sir. sir. No, no, that's okay. That's okay. He pays it down. He goes back, does his thing. And so she's paid her fee. He gets done first, so he starts late. She says, no, sir, sir, please, please. i got to pay you back. No, 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 I don't want any money. No, sir, uh, I want your number. No, don't worry about it. And he walks away, and so last thing, she says, come to the mosque. There's two mosques in Sydney. I want to I talk to you. Please come to the mosque. So Rodney's nephew was going to Southern. Those two, they wait for two whole months. They finally decide, well, maybe we should go check this out. So they go, and they're freaking out. They don't know what's going to happen, so they go to the mosque, take their shoes off and everything else, and, and, and they look really, I guess, you know, scared or whatever, and some guy comes up to them and says, oh, you're just visiting the first time? Yeah. So uh, in the way they're looking and everything, they, they don't know what's going on. You know, can we, can we come in? He says, well, sure, anybody can come in. Oh, okay, cool. We'll take our shoes off. Yeah, fine. Well, then, then they, they said, well, are, are you a Christian or something? To Rodney and Carl. And he says, oh, yeah, we're Christians. And then he says, oh, interesting. And he says, what kind of Christian? Oh, we're Seventh-day Adventists. Oh, really? I've never heard of them. What are they? He says, now get this. This is the last thing I would ever say. I'm too discerning. I would never say this. <laughs> Good thing I wasn't there because the Holy Spirit would accomplish nothing with me. And so, so tell me about you. Oh, we don't eat pork. We don't drink alcohol. We don't smoke. They do, but I mean, the al- they, he says, what? Why? Because it's in the Bible. Well, so, so anyways, uh, they say, do you want to meet the, the Amman? Sure, they don't even know what Amman is, but they drag these two in there, meet the Amman, and and the guy says, these guys are Seventh-day Adventists. He says, well, I've heard about Adventists. I don't know much about you guys. Well, they don't drink they don't drink alcohol and they don't eat pork. What? Didn't know that. He says, I'm really interested. I'm really interested in you guys. Uh, I wouldn't mind if you share me a bit about what you believe. And I would like to share you what Islam believes or what, what our beliefs are. So would you mind if we, right off the bat, mind if we set up a mutual PhD, multiple PhDs, these guys not. And so they set up a Bible study. What do they do? Rodney and Carl start out with a revelation thing they downloaded from, I don't know, Amazing Facts or whatever else. I would have never done that. But this guy saw themselves in the prophecy. (laughs) So as we're studying back and forth, then he has the dreams, okay? This is how it all starts to get going. And uh, so anyway, so so we we go in the the second night. We're at the, sorry, we're at the, the Amman's house. And we're, we're visiting, and, and they're just super gracious people, just wonderful people, and we're, we're talking, and we're having a good time, and his wife is wearing a scarf, and my wife wore a scarf. She says, look, you don't have to. So my wife says, no, 
I want to respect you. I'm going to wear the scarf now, and I'm going to wear the scarf when we go to the mosque. You don't have to, but thank you. So anyway, so we're, we're visiting there. Second, second time there, I don't have a clue what I'm going to talk about. So I turned to him. He said, well, I think we should probably start getting heading down to the mosque. I said, okay. So I turned to him. I said, do you have any idea what me to talk about? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm thinking, well, that would have sure been nice if you had let me know ahead of time so I could at least come prepared. So he said, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I know what I, yeah, I want you to tell us when Jesus is coming from a Christian perspective. You know, that's what brings the end of the world. Muslims believe in Jesus coming brings the end of the world. They don't believe he's divine and stuff, but I already learned that part. So anyways, so he says, oh yeah, that's what I want you to speak about, the second coming of Jesus. Well, you know, I'm not necessarily, I don't preach that topic very often. But thought, oh well, so what? You know, just leave it up to the Holy Spirit to, to make it happen. So that, okay, fine, so it'll be the second coming. So we get down there. I sit down, and, and the first meeting they gave me a Quran in English. I went home, I actually read the Quran. And I'm trying to get all the information I could come. And here's some logger in British Columbia named Rudy Harnish has got the most impressive, uh, what's the name, salahala.com. He's got the most incredible stuff where he compares the Bible to the Quran and absolutely makes every Muslim believe that, I mean, not, not like he's faking it, but he brings all these parallels together so it builds beautiful bridges. And he had all this information printed. I never even knew who he was. He's in my province and he's a logger. Now he's the head of Amazing Facts Canada. But anyways, so I got all this information from him between the first and the second time. By now, I had started to mark my Quran up like I do my Bible, you know, cross-referencing. And so I'm digging around to prove the Injil, you know, like the New Testament. So I'm digging around in my Quran. Oh, I found the, the first text. So now I could use the Quran to prove what I'm going to talk about. So, so anyways, I'm sitting in the front row like there, and here's the stage and all the cameras and stuff. And, and so I'm sitting there and I lay my Bible down and I put the Quran down. Whoa, I didn't know that was a bad deal. And somebody comes up and they just, you can't put the Bible, you can't put the Quran on the ground. Sorry. So I pick them up and I'm just holding them like this. I thought, oops, I probably really blew it being in the front. And anyway, so, so get up. Holy Spirit took over. And so then I thought, okay, so I, so I found my first text in the, but I, but I heard that by that night, I heard you can't mark in your Quran. So I got the Iman sitting here and I'm over here. You know, my cross references. So I started reading all the surahs supporting the New Testament. So after I'm done that, I said, okay, so now that we understand that the Quran supports the Gospels, not the New Testament, the Gospels, I said, now that we know it supports it, I said, I'm going to go to one of those Gospels. I'm going to Matthew 24. And so I go through this whole thing, Matthew 24, all the signs of the coming and the end, you know, which they don't have. And everybody's just like totally mesmerized. So I go through this whole thing. And then I get to verse 14. This hit me because, because I've, I've used this before in, in, our, in Christian settings. But, but 14, what's unique about 14? It says, this Gospel will be preached and then the end will come. And what, I, what hit me one morning was this. Of all the prophecies in the entire Bible, I shared this with them, so I'll just share it from just... Of all the prophecies in the entire Bible, they all share one thing in common, except one, but they all share one thing in common. That's this. I have no influence whatsoever where any of the, where, if the, any of those things ever take place or don't take. No influence whatsoever. All the prophecies that were prophesied and already fulfilled, I have no impact on that. Nothing. All the prophecies coming ahead, wars and rumors of war, I can't influence that. I can't pray them forward. I, I have no influence whatsoever. So all the prophecies in the Bible, I have no influence on whatsoever. So I was thinking about that one day. So why do I spend so much time, why do we spend so much time studying prophecy when you can't do much about it anyways? And here's what we do. We study prophecy till we're blue in the face, sitting in the pews the whole time warming them. And then all of a sudden you got this one verse, 14. This gospel will be preached and then the end comes. And it hit me one morning, like just like a ton of bricks. You know what's different about this particular prophecy than every other prophecy in the entire Bible? It has everything to do with me. This gospel, by who will this gospel be preached? It has everything to do with me. In other words, I influence, I can influence when Jesus comes back. We're not waiting for him like we say. 
He's waiting for us. And so the most hypocritical prayer, I didn't tell them that, but I'll just, the most hypocritical, hypocritical prayer anybody could ever pray is sit in a pew while you warm it and say, come Lord Jesus quickly while I sit here and wait for you. I understand exactly when you're coming. Not exactly because we don't date, whatever. That's a hypocritical prayer. Why? Because if we're not out there finishing this work, this gospel will be preached. Then why pray Jesus return sooner when we're not doing what we're supposed to do? Remember, we are the light of the world. So anyway, so, so I got to that point, to them. And I says, and I didn't even know this, but I said all the prophecies in the Quran and all the prophecies in the Bible share this. I, just like I shared with you, except I added the Quran in there. And I said, except one, and it's dependent on us. And I says, tell you what, Jesus is waiting for you, he's waiting for us to spread this gospel. I said, here's where I'm ending. I'm not going to tell you what the gospel is. That's for you to figure out. But when you figure it out, you can actually be part of bringing Jesus back sooner. And these people are crazy afterwards. I mean, they just, because they, they have a commission on their life now, right? I mean, there's something. The woman brings her truckload of Bibles. Are these are like $25, $30. These aren't cheap paperbacks. They hand them out to everybody and everybody's just like treasuring these. They're just holding them against their chest. It was unbelievable. And then the, before they hand the Bibles out, the, the Amon gets up and he says, people, to the cameras, because this is all over the world for the Muslims. He says, Herb Larson is the Seventh-day Adventist. They have the message, we have the money and the network. We've got to finish this work. And then he says, we got to finish building Nehemiah's wall. And I'm like, I can't believe this, you know. So we go, six months later, I'm back. Don't go to the guy's house, go right to the, to the mosque. And while I'm there, or, or I get there, I say, have any idea what you want me to talk about tonight? What do you suppose? He had it all figured out. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, he knows exactly what I want you to talk about. Guess what? I want you to tell us about the Sabbath. And by this time, we had lots of denominations of pastors, and we had the North, or not, or not, Pacific Division guys, and unions, and all these people, because nobody could figure it out. And I'm like, well, what am I doing here? I mean, this is just ridiculous. And so, and there was a Catholic priest there in his robes. And so, so we, so I, so I get there, and he said, I want you to speak about the Sabbath. Don't hold back. And I'm like, wow, another one of them topics that I'd like a little bit of time to brush up. But also, what? It's somewhere in there. The Holy Spirit can drag it out. So get going on the Sabbath. And then it started to formulate, you know? Like, I mean, I'm listening to this stuff going on. It starts to formulate. And so after I talk about the whole chronology of the Sabbath, chronologically, that, to me, that's what the most impactful way to share it is rather than proof text, chronology. Before sin entered. Sabbath. Let's ask a question right there before sin entered. If sin never entered the world, what day would we still be keeping? Sabbath. So, interesting. Sin comes, all of a sudden something changes. Hmm. Anyways, chronology all the way through. Right out into after we're in heaven. So, go through all that. And then, uh, and then it just all of a sudden came. And it was like, now here's the thing. I said, do you guys realize we're worshiping on the Sabbath right now? It's Friday night. It's after sundown. Yeah, we're working sheep on the Sabbath. And I said, here's the thing. This is just as much binding on you as Seventh-day Adventists. You as Islam, it's just as binding on you as us. Why? Because you are from the lineage of Ishmael. It all started with Abraham. Amen. You are the lineage of Ishmael because they're proud of that. I'm the lineage of Isaac. So because Abraham is the pinnacle of all this, it's just as binding on you. So you have to keep this holy. Starting tonight, till tomorrow night, sundown. <laughs> like, and the Amman is getting, he's starting to squirm a little bit. And so, so I, and like I said, it sounds like, oh yeah, you got it all figured out. No, I don't have a clue what I was saying. It just went. And so... So the Iman gets up afterwards, and now he's got a bit of a dilemma. He says, well, 
And I said, in the Quran, it talks about six days. I said, the Bible says six days, but the Quran says six literal days. Because in that one, oh yes, I found all the texts about the Sabbath in the Quran. There's plenty of them. One of them says, if you do not keep the Sabbath, you're not, nothing more than a monkey. Those are the very words. I quoted all those because I found the first one in my cross-referencing way over here because I didn't want them to see it written in there. So quote all the Quran before I did the Bible. So anyways, at the very end, Dr. Laban, he, he's the Amman, he gets up and he says, well, uh, yes, Sabbath is absolutely binding. Anybody who claims to be Christian, he says, Sabbath is a must. And he says, of course, we know the Catholic Church changed it all anyways, and here sits this priest. And he starts giving the hard stuff, which I would never give. And he starts hammering that stuff. So he's done some research on his whole thing. And so, so he, he gets his whole pitch, and he says, but, he says, you know, and I had said in my talk that the Quran says six literal days of creation. And he says, but, you know, six, six days, a day could be a thousand years, you know. A day could be a hundred years. A day could be, you know, and he's trying to come up with all this. And he realizes all these people are like, he just explained it. <laughs> and then he doesn't know where to go. He just absolutely flakes out on it, you know. And so trying to undo the damage I did by putting the commitment on them. Not me, because it wasn't me. Undo the damage that the Holy Spirit put on them. So then he says, you know, I think we should do, why don't we have a question and answer period right now? So he calls another junior Amon or whatever it is. He comes up. So they sit here. Herb, you sit there. So I'm sitting here. And I thought, oh, man. You know, I don't mind questions and answers, but this could be. And so he, he looks and he says, oh, I guess this probably looks unfair. Two of us, one of him. So by this time, he had met this retired Adventist pastor. The guy had come and visited Dr. Laban. And by this time, the general conference had said, Ron Johnston and all those guys had all come down there to see what the world's going on. You know, and, and then he wanted to co-write a book on the second coming of the Jesus from Quran and biblical perspective. Whatever, I don't want to get into that. It fell apart, and he was very upset about it. But anyways, so what happened is uh, we have this question. So this old pastor, retired guy that, that he had you know, met in between these talks, he says, oh, pastor, blah, 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 could you come up here? So this old guy comes up, and I look at him, I figure, oh, yikes. Not much help by the looks of it. I mean, that's my pride. You know, it, it wells up and down, and Holy Spirit sometimes have to hit it hard. And so I'm looking at that. Yikes. So then he starts asking questions. He asks me a question. Should have been easy. I'm like, I, ha I can't put one sentence together. I couldn't even put one thought process together. I'm just sitting there like this. This guy starts to answer it, nails it. Unbelievable answer. Ask another question, looking at me. <laughs> Seven or eight questions in a row, and I'm good at just trying to pretend. I couldn't say one word. But after about three, I just looked to him right away. And the Holy Spirit, here's what happened. The Holy Spirit said, you think you're something? Forget about it. He's got the Holy Spirit now. We give him the Holy Spirit. Make a fool of yourself, open your mouth, or just sit there. <laughs> I mean... Those weren't words, but that's what I got the picture. So he's sitting there, and they ask question after question after question. And he just eloquently, I mean, it was like God sends stuff. And I'm sitting there, oh, yeah, well, that's sure. Well, thank you. I went up and met the guy. I said, oh, that was awesome. The Holy Spirit had you, boy, not me. I, once I sat down, that was it. The Holy Spirit said, you're off. He's on. And so, but the interesting thing of all that stuff is, then I had two more appointments booked and Dr. LeBon got cancer really bad, went quickly, died. And so I have no idea where it was going. I have no idea if it's still going to revive. I don't have, I don't know what's going on. It doesn't matter. It's not my call anyways. It's a divine appointment. You go do it. And God takes over. But that's the thrill of working for God. You know, strange stuff happens. And, and you soon realize, it brings humility when you realize, I should never be invited to this because I am nothing but some twit. Ask my wife, yes, oh yeah. She's told me before. Honey, if you're watching, I know you aren't. <clears throat> Not even four weeks ago, I had to preach on one topic, forgiveness. I was doing a whole evangelistic series to the lost. 
I approach it different than traditional by long shot. So that night, I was talking about forgiveness, what it means, and all the mechanics of it. And uh, my wife says, hmm, people will screw you in business, and you don't want to let it go. So you're going to go talk on forgiveness tonight? Really? It was such a disaster, I went there and basically confessed I shouldn't be speaking about forgiveness tonight. I did. It was televised. They, so the, it was for um, uh, QTV, no, T, uh, what is it called? Covardis, whatever, QVTV. It's one of them like amazing discoveries and stuff, same people, it does. So they had to come up and say, what happened? I says, well, I guess reality hits once in a while. I don't know what you want to do with that one. Oh, we're not airing that one. Because <laughs> I just had to get up, just admit it. I said, what I was going to talk about, it's not going to happen. Uh, you know, and I talked about my own, in, you know, inefficiencies. I mean, I said, I'm just some twit, you know, there's no doubt about it. You know, all I can do is just go on the grace of Jesus, you know. I get ticked off, I lose it, I have, you know, I sometimes look at a, a woman and lust. I, uh, I, 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 I have done lots of stuff. So, admit it. So only by the grace of Jesus is there anything for me. Amen. But you just daily go back there and just say, look, I know, I, <laughs> I'm unworthy of anything, but oh, that grace is so beautiful. I give it all to you. I accept, I want to stand under the banner of Jesus. I accept the bloody spilled on Calvary for me in all its detail. Just take me and use me where you want today. Amen. I just want to be an empty vessel for you let me see ahead of time into eyes of people to know who I need to visit with, who I need to bring this up with. You, Holy Spirit, go ahead of me and start touching hearts before I even arrive. Give me the eyes of Jesus so I can see through people. Amen. And stuff happens. So thank you, Herb. We uh, had a 3 o'clock and a 4.15, but we actually just went, yep. and, went and, and you know what? Time flew by, and I don't think anybody even noticed how fast it was going. But So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I want to um, thank you for coming. Uh, I want to, at this time, uh, we want to have a love offering for Herb. I know Herb says, I, I, I just come, the Lord does, you know, but... No, 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 no. So you blessed us, so you can't rob us of blessing you. No, I so. already got the blessing. I've met a lot more people. I'm, <laughs> I'm staying with Jack and Marcella. I go, hey, what else do I need? Okay, okay. Well, I'm not going to argue with I'm not going to argue with so yeah, well, Take least. up the love offering and give it to a witnessing program in your church. That would be happy. Okay. <laughs> do we want to do that? Okay, let's take a love offering anyway. And we'll take a love offering up, and we'll use it for... Outreach. Outreach. Yeah, there you go. So uh, let's do that this time. I'm just going to have a quick prayer, and we'll do that. Father in heaven, Lord, again, thank you for your servant, Herb, and what you're doing in his life, Lord. And hopefully it's instilling in us and uh, inspiring us, Lord, to be your hands and feet, just as we sing about this morning in our worship service, Lord, to put ourselves out there. We know that when we do that, Lord, it... Uh, it can be a little trepidation there because uh, we're going into a place that maybe is uncomfortable for us, that's uh, outside our comfort zone. But Lord, we're living in last day of times here. We're living in, in the, the, the uh, brink of eternity. And so, Lord, we need to be willing to be step out and be used for you. So please give us that courage, Lord. Please give us that little nudge when we need it and give us the willingness to uh, move forward uh, in with you. And so thank you for being here with us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to take up an offering. We're just going to go for outreach for those who'd like to contribute. Uh, thank you, Herb, for being here. Uh, any last thoughts? Anybody have any questions they want to ask Herb at all? We <laughs> okay, so Herb, do you want to come for the Don has a question. Yeah. Spiritually. That's what I've been for 10 years. I'm, I've been, work, like I, I shared it with the guys last night, okay? So 
Night Shift is a well-known organization in Canada run by the evangelicals. They feed the street people. We have two big street issues, in, one in Vancouver, British Columbia, Hastings, Eat Hastings, and we have another one in Surrey, British Columbia, which is a suburb of Vancouver. 150, 200 people every night are fed by various churches, but, put, but sponsored by the evangelical church. Ten years ago, they asked me, ten years ago this May, so nine and a half years ago, they came up and uh, or they phoned me and asked if I'd be willing, because they said, we've been feeding them now for eight years. Would you be willing to come and run a Bible study on the street? And uh, I shared some of that last night, so you can watch that, but whatever. So, so like, I, like I was telling the guys last night, I didn't want to do it, absolutely didn't want to do it. Because I've helped my wife's more into that stuff, but I've been out feeding them before and stuff, you know, giving out sandwiches. And I, eh, you know what, it's just not my thing. Because I'm the one who had the problem, obviously. So then, uh, so, I, so while I'm trying to come up with my best excuse to get out of this, I said, sure, why not? And that was that. And so then we're, we're running Bible. So we started in an airport or bus. 20 passenger, everybody facing in. We're going to buy this thing for 12,000 bucks, and the guy found out what we're doing with it. Yours, free. In fact, I'll fill it up with diesel. So we start there, outgrew that, got part of the storefront, gave a space. Now we got a full storefront. I don't know, it's probably 15, 1,600 square feet, all glass. So you got 150 people with their backs against the glass, shooting heroin, smoking crack, three feet from where I sit running the Bible study every night. All the young girls when we go away are huddled together because all the creeps are waiting around for people to go. This is the way it is. And so, but you know, here's what I discovered. When we did our first Bible study, I had no idea. I mean, I was, I was nervous. And we're stuffed in this thing. It stunk like you wouldn't believe in this tiny little, you know, not tiny, but whatever. It's a bus, airport or bus. And, I, and the, everybody says, well, what, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. And they said, because I had two business friends. We were kind of taking this project on. So I don't really know. And I just left it up to spirit, and it just happened. And here's, but I'm sitting there, I'm, the first night, I didn't tell this guy's last night, so I'll tell this part. First night, I'm, I'm trying to make a point. So we're just, ad-lib, we're just ad-libbing. I bought a bunch of Bibles. Oh, let's go to, nobody knows how to find anything in the Bible. So I realized, okay, we can learn from that. So we learned a lot of stuff. But anyways, so then, so, this, so I'm trying to make this point, and I could just see all these, you know, nobody's getting it. Mm-hmm. And then this one guy, he is, you can't get lo- look more beat up than him. And he just gets a smile on his face, and he says, his name's Randy. I call him my resident preacher. And so, and I don't know any of these people, and they're really suspicious about outsiders, but my one business, though two business buddies are with me, they've been feeding them now for eight years, so there's this confidence. That's why they came, because I could never win anybody's respect without having someone that endorses me. With that, that's the way it works. So anyway, so, so Randy says, oh, you're, I know what you're trying to say, 9-11. I'm going, 9-11. I said, oh, you mean Psalms 91, one on. Yeah. I said, great. That's perfect. Nice. And it was. It was absolutely perfect. It was like you couldn't get better for what I was trying to make. Well, I couldn't do it. So I said, let's all go to Psalms 91. <laughs> so, so we're, oh, okay. So we're all helping him get to this. We barely start trying to find it for everybody. And what does Randy do? He recites the entire chapter, Psalms 91, starting with verse 1. The entire chapter. He's looking across, across the bus at the window and recites the entire chapter, flawless. And I'm like, wow, this is exciting. I mean, this guy shouldn't be able to put three words together. And he just got through reciting a whole chapter. A little later on in the first meeting. Oh, and he recites another big, long verse. Oh, God. And for every week after that, that's why I said, oh, Randy's our resident preacher. And so I said, I said, Randy, where, where did you learn this stuff? Oh, I used to read the Bible. And I said, no, but you had to have. And, we, and, and some of this stuff was sort of, a, sort of a little bit Adventist-y, you know? I mean, the slant that he was coming out with. And so I said, no, seriously. I mean, you read the Bible, okay, but did, oh, yeah, well, I went to these meetings one time. 
I said, well, when was that? Oh, it's probably, I don't know, eight or nine years ago. And I says, well, what was it? He says, well, it was this video thing. Oh, amazing facts. <laughs> it doesn't matter. He didn't remember that from then. He, it's just the Holy Spirit said, we, okay, we need to get it across by one of them. And whatever. So that's the kind of stuff. So the point is, is this. The level of depth we Bible study there every Wednesday night is the same level we had at church today or whatever. Nothing held back. No, no diluting it. We just give it both barrels and the Holy Spirit absolutely overcomes. Everybody gets it. And they can't wait. And if I have to miss, because I'm gone sometimes, I have to miss, you would, my other business buddy, He's at every meeting. He kind of takes care of all the stuff. And if somebody gets out of hand, which it happens. Here's the other thing. In our Bible studies, I wouldn't say every week, but we get lots of F-bombs in our Bible study. Well, whatever. At first, it was like, I don't have to worry about it. The other people say, hey, man, you shouldn't be saying that. You know, I mean, we're in a Bible study. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. You know what I mean? So they all do the checkup. But anyway, so... So the, the cool thing about it is you just hit them with as heavy as you can hit it and the Spirit takes over. It is phenomenal. One guy was sharing at our table today, Pat maybe shared it last, my, my dad's conference president, he was at Andrews, Herb Larson, you, you probably remember him. He was, uh, good to see it. <laughs> we used to speak together and stuff with seeds, traveled all over. Anyway, so, so my dad was at Andrews uh, in, in the Lake, Lake Union, whatever. So he's done all this stuff. But his 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 greatest spiritual, what would you call it? Comrade or whatever the word is, is Pat from our street studies. Come in 10 years, Pat gives Bible studies to everybody. And he doesn't hold back. He's given Bible studies all week long, his prayers. I could go into my phone and read you some of his prayers. They would make you weep. They're, so, they're deeper than I've heard anybody pray. He types these all out. And he's got, he doesn't remember if he's got a 6th or 7th grade education. Can't remember. Heroin addict, 30 years. Tried everything. Crack, cocaine, uh, meth, you name it. He's been all of it. And, uh, and, and been in jail multiple times. And I asked him, well, what did you get jailed for? Oh, assault. Well, what did you do? Oh, I took the guy's head off, you know. And I mean, it's just, and now here he is. He comes to church. He, oh, get this. White Rock Seventh Day Adventist Church, if you go on there and look at their live stream and stuff, Pat has led Sabbath school now probably five times. I had the privilege of baptizing him down on the street in a hot tank because we have our baptisms there. And who runs our praise music when we're doing it? We make a big deal out of it. I get the Pentecostals because they're the ones running this whole thing. And here I am, Seventh Day Adventist, running Bible studies for them. I don't get into the Sabbath and all those things, but 80% of the people that come to our Bible studies are Seventh-day Adventists, they come to church. Because the other business guys goes around, gets up early, goes around finding them all, picks them all up, brings them all to church. It is awesome. One, one story, uh, sorry, I know it's getting late. One story, this is awesome how God works. One guy, his name is Freebrick. This guy never takes a shower. You can't, his feet are rotting off his feet. I mean, literally, they're just raw. The smell is beyond comprehension. And one Sabbath he comes to church, and I always try to sit with them, my wife and I, you know, with their, they sit down on the front right side of our, our big huge church, and we're having communion that week. <clears throat> and so Greg, the other business guy, he turns to me and he says, well, I guess I'll take free brick. I says, no, no, I've been thinking about it while they're talking about the communion. I've been thinking about it. No, I have to do this. I have to do the foot washing with him. No, I can do it. I said, no, Greg, I have to do it to get over this. So I, I turned to Freebeck. I said, hey, you want to go share the foot washing? With you? Oh, yeah, sure, no problem. So we go, we get there, and, we're, and it's all crowded. Everybody around, I think, oh, man, what's going to happen? And during church, you'd kick off your shoe, no socks. And it's just like for 30 feet around, it's just like. <laughs> and so I thought, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I have to do it. And so literally, I pray, I said, okay, God, just stop the smell from everybody else around here because they're just going to flee. And this is no word of a lie, and this is validated by the people around me, including Greg and stuff. I pray this little prayer as if I needed to. I mean, it's a, it was a selfish prayer, actually. 
Friedrich, I'm, I'm kneeled down. I said, I'll, I'll do your feet first. He's got his shoes off. Zero smell. Zero smell coming from him at all. The whole thing. Amen. And nobody caught on that there would have been anything. That is so exciting to me, stuff like that, because that's such a little nitpicky thing. But God's a big God of little things. And, and afterwards I said, you know, to couple them, they, our, our, our music pastor was right, right behind me. And I didn't talk to him, actually. I talked to the other person he's sharing with. Did anybody, you know, like anybody smelling? No, not a thing. So I thought, well, maybe God just helped me out. But no, it was just like God just took care of the situation. It's like, okay, you're willing to do that? Well, here's a little favor in return. You don't deserve it. It would have been better if you worked your way through that, but... To me, that's awesome. <laughs> that is really awesome. Anyways, yeah, so that, I, did I even answer your question? Oh, so anyways, the, with Bible, just, you can start Bible studies with them. And, and it might be, but here's the thing with, with, with homeless people, if you've got a homeless program, and, and I mentioned this last night, I think it was, or maybe it was this morning. Remember their names. Write them down, whatever, because they win the lottery every time you say their name. Number one. Number two, you've got to find a way to Build a trust, because all human relationships, or, or any relationship, animal to human, whatever, is all based on trust. So you've got to find a way to build trust. I learned a lot of this stuff from the previous guys that were working with them. Now, one thing that worked for me, and I don't even know if I should get into this, because I did share it here, I think, at Milo, for your TV thing here. Uh, my testimony of being thrown in jail. Yeah. Now, yeah, just go look it up. I don't want to get into the story. But anyways, so I got thrown in jail. I spent five days in federal prison. And then for two and a half years under, you know, they want to put me away for 27 years for something I didn't even do. It was all political, whatever. I'm not getting into it. Go watch it on there. But anyways, so, so with, uh, and I think they posted it on YouTube. I saw it on there one time. Somebody told me it was on there. So, but the point is, is my first night there, I didn't mention this. My two buddies, the business guys, have been feeding them for eight years. So they got credibility because they're very suspicious of everybody. They're paranoid. They won't trust anybody because their whole life's been burned. Mm -hmm. And so, so, the, the, so that I, you know, so they came because they had to try to smooth me into this thing. So the first night, I don't even know how it came up anymore because it was like 10 years ago. But somehow, and at that time, this thing going to jail was pretty raw to me yet. And out of my mouth came the words, when I was in jail... And I don't talk about it. It's just, it's humiliating, uh, even though it was, none of it was legitimate, but still, whatever. So I said, when I was in jail, and everybody stops, you did time? Well, I didn't want to say, oh, I only did, you know, five days or whatever. <laughs> you did time? Yep. Yeah. Oh, I did 17 years, and I did two years. Oh, I've been in and out of the slammer, on and on. In that one statement, <laughs> I was in. And I often thought, why did I have to go through that jail whole, you know, spending 250000 on lawyers defending myself? Why did I have to go through all this stuff? Uh, you know, when God just took it away, once two and a half years of under the prosecution thing, boom, sorry, we're going to drop the charges. Didn't have any in the first place, but whatever. Six felony charges, 27 years. I thought, why did I have to go through that? I couldn't preach for two years until a judge heard that I couldn't continue my ministry anymore and he blasted the prosecutor so bad, it was like, I can't believe you can get away with doing this. He says, you're stopping this guy from, from uh, preaching the gospel? Are you kidding me? And, and the lawyers, one of the prosecutors runs right over to my lawyer and says, we'll write a writ, no problem. He can have his passport back so he can travel. Before that, oh, you're not going anywhere. You're a risk to flight. And so anyways, so I thought, why do I have to go through all that? Well, I can't tell you how many times now it's come in handy to bring that, especially with the straight people. Like that, God, if it was only worth that, if that was the only reason for it, you know what? Because what? it's always easy to look back. But when I look back and all that pain and suffering, laying awake, stressed, crying, you know, all that kind of stuff, and then you see how it's impacted, worth it. Amen. So find ways to build trust relationships. And when you do, these are going to be the best friends you ever had because what you see is what you get. Well, there might be some F-bombs and other four-letter words. Ignore it. Because before long, their transition takes place and you're going to have people that will be doing your work. Amen. 
Our, Bi our Bible study people now are some of the new leaders of Night Shift. Just doing a fantastic job. Anyways, yeah, that's, I mean, there's lots of other stuff we've learned, but if you want any of the Bible studies, we've got hundreds of them, so you can share them with you or you can just, whatever you want. Holy Spirit covers anyways. Because okay. I write all our own Bible studies. Any, any other questions? Yeah, <clears throat> that's just two parts out of 20. So those are just about complete. I've got 18 written. I've got two more to go. And then there's a website in Australia. It'll be called, I, I don't put any of this stuff. I don't have any ministry, you know, like, like I have nothing. Somebody says, oh, yeah, you have a website? No, well, then how can people phone you? I don't know. You know, I don't have a website. I don't, there's over a million of one series DVDs produced. I don't have nothing to do with it. They don't make money on it, I don't make money on it. I don't take a dime for any of it. Honorarium's gone, don't take them. So, so the point is, is, is uh, back to your question the, about these studies. Somebody's putting a website together called Herb Larson Ministries at the little at sign one, at one, at tone, at one, little at one, whatever, the, clever. So they're putting that together in Australia. I mean, I have nothing to do with it. They, they wanted to do it. So all these Bible studies and, and hundreds of sermons are going on that website because they used to have one down there and then it just was too sluggish. The millennials come along and say, oh, you don't know what you're doing. We've got to build a new website, whatever. So that's what they're doing. And uh, so, so it'll be fairly soon because they're waiting for me to get this. I said, I don't really want to issue anything else until I get the cross on there because to me that's like the pinnacle of understanding, to understand what went on on the cross. But if anybody wants them, I can give you my email and I can send them. I can send, better yet, if a bunch of people want them, I'll just send them to one source here and then you can spread them out from there in emails. Send them to Chuck. Okay, yeah. I can do that, Chuck. I'll send you everything that's done so far. Or I'll send you 15 because there's the last couple we're working on. But anyways, they're all, our, our beta test is the Bible study at the street. And you'll see the level of how deep we get with these people and no problem. So anyways, yeah, so I'll get them to Chuck and... And then anybody can, you know, contact Chuck. Because, like, I get hundreds of emails, and I, it's, it's sometimes hard to get to all this stuff to feed them back. But, it, but I could do, that would help if I could do that. Yeah, any other questions? Or? Thank you. Well, thank you. And it's nice making new friends and meeting old friends. And Murray back there, we grew up together in Calgary, Alberta, a block apart from each other. If you want any dirt on them, I'm sure I can come up with some stuff. <laughs> I right, better not, because Murray probably got some too, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for staying around, and hope you were blessed as I was. Thank you.